Well, hello everyone. Welcome to the Thrive webinar. We're excited to see each one of you today. And we've got an incredible interview with John Ortberg. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Ray sat down with him in Palm Desert. And uh, it's really a very impactful interview. We got to watch uh, some of it over the last few days and uh, very heartfelt. And so uh, very excited to bring it to you today. Um, we have uh, next week, we're doing a special webinar. Pastor Ray and Pastor Andrew McCourt are going to have a conversation about when leaders fail. And we you don't have to look far to see the headlines across the country with some big failures across our country uh, in some of the key churches around the U.S. And so we want to talk about that uh, we want to be able to dive deeper into some of that and talk about how you can protect your ministry. So that'll be next weekend, and we're excited again to to be able to have that and host that. So uh, we're going to go ahead and we've got a really it's actually a very uh, it's a full length um, interview today. So we're going to have Dan go ahead and start roll that right now. Thanks for joining us, everyone. John. I've been looking forward to this conversation for a long time. We have a lot of mutual friends. We've yep. been friends for a long time. And um, and for those of you that are diving into this thing and you're listening to this, this some people are single bullet people. Other people are shotguns. And I'm we're going to be talking about spiritual life, preaching, hmm. crazy stuff, um, leadership, all of the family, all of this kind of stuff. Um, but I want to start with this. For folks that don't know you, can mm -hmm. you give them a short bio? Kind of where'd you grow up? How'd you grow up? Yep. And then all the way to today. Yep. Uh, and I love, uh, everything's connected. So I, yeah. I love uh, connecting those kind of dots together. Yep. Um, I grew up in Rockford, Illinois, which is a Swedish town in the Midwest. My dad grew up in the Covenant Church, which a lot of people probably who go to Bayside may not know it's part of the Covenant Church. But I am wearing blue and yellow in honor of <laughs> the Swedish roots of... Um, Bayside, uh, grew up in a Christian family and um, went to uh, Christian college, Wheaton College, and then came out to California and went to Fuller Seminary. You and I shared that also. We were talking at dinner last night mm -hmm. about names like John Holland and Bob Munger and people yep. that were real formative. And um, I got a degree in theology, but also psychology because I've always been interested in the human condition. Why are people the way they are? How do we change? Uh, and I thought I would go into therapy because most people in my program did. But I started doing therapy and I hated it. And I was terrible <laughs> at it. People got worse the more I talked to them. And, uh, and I didn't like doing it. And I also started working at a church and just loved it. Started to preach and I felt so alive. So I ended up going into church ministry and served at several different churches. And communication in particular I love. Most recently, I had been for 17 years in Menlo Park. Yep. And uh, you were a regular part of my life. Periodically, you'd be on yep. the radio there. Yep. And uh, there are certain Ray Johnston phrases. Um, matter of fact, <laughs> I don't know if you know this, but when you're preaching, very often you move from one point to another one in matter of fact or other words. And yes. you have such an engaging way of laying out the faith. And we would periodically have folks that leave the Bay Area, cash out their house and move to Sacramento. Yep. And I think every one of them ended up at Bayside just because there's so much vibrancy in the church. Yeah, the joke for us is would the last person to leave the Bay Area just turn off the light? <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Yeah. it was crazy. And, and then you actually, we back up a little bit, you planted a church. I did. Okay, which is yes. a whole different skill set. Yep. And then you went from there to Willow Creek. Yes. Okay, um, what was that like? Yeah. Uh, I, mean, I was point, in a that's church. That's the largest I was at a church in Southern California that was basically a church plant, a group of folks that were kind of connected to Azusa Pacific University, which you're a part of. One of them is off camera, but Dave Bixby, who's a really good friend sitting right over there, was part of that core group. And so I was there for about five years, huge struggle. You know, I, I loved being there. We had a great time, but we were never able to get the kind of momentum we were all hoping for. And yes, I went from there to Willow Creek Community Church uh, and I was teaching the staff the first week I was there and I looked out and I realized there are more people on the staff at this stinking church than there were who attended the church that I was coming for. So it was very strange in, in terms of scale. On the other hand, it was odd because people would look at me all of a sudden like I must know what I'm talking about <laughs> just because I'm at a church that's large. I didn't know any more than yep. I knew the previous week. Yep. And I wasn't any happier than I was the previous week. Yep. So it, it was a really interesting perspective on 
church life. Yep, no kidding. And you've been married for how long? I've been married since 1983, so it'll be 38 years this June. Uh, my wife, Nancy, is also uh, very involved in ministry. She actually heads up an organization called Transforming the Bay with Christ that is seeking to bring spiritual renewal to uh, church leaders, faith organizations in the Bay Area. Fantastic. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Um, this, it was, it's funny, we're in Palm Springs. I was here exactly 12 months ago, huh. like today. Oh, wow. And 12 months ago, uh, this week, uh, the major tennis tournament down here pulled the plug. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, and nobody saw this coming. It was a Sunday. I preached at Southwest Church. We do Thrive North and South. So our Thrive Conference is down here as well. And we were selling out Thrive at Southwest Church wow. Sunday morning. Sunday afternoon, the tennis tournament pulled the plug. Coachella pulled the plug and we pulled the plug. And all of America went into turmoil and mm -hmm. shut down. And, and I actually wrote this when I was thinking about this. I went, chaos reigned. And it has been 12 straight months of nothing but chaos. Mm -hmm. um, and that's been in my life, in our church. Um, I don't know how many pandemics there are. There has been a health pandemic for business people, a financial pandemic for other people, a personal pandemic where I, we have people get married, nobody can come. People have lost loved ones yeah. that couldn't be in the hospital. Yeah. Um, you know, we had two babies born, the second one, we couldn't be anywhere near the, I mean, it was crazy. Then there was a race pandemic and then a political firestorm like we've never seen. And, and, I, the, and so I wanna ask you a question, in what ways have you just felt insane chaos yourself? Yeah. And what have you done to cope with that and to survive? Yep. So, uh, you know, the big word for 2020 was the word unprecedented. And uh, I Smart. think it went up. I, I, somebody was talking about on the Google, as a Google search term, up exponentially, just that word. And when I was thinking about it, I was thinking, actually, uh, uh, COVID wasn't the worst uh, influenza we've ever had. Spanish flu was way, way worse, you know, killed like 50 million. Uh, uh, politics was a mess, but the Civil War was worse. Racial stuff is a mess, but slavery and Jim Crow is worse. Um, uh, somebody was asking um, what's going to be next locusts, and it turns out there are actually <laughs> locusts in East Africa that were threatening the food supply for like 70 million people. Um, none of that stuff, it, it's all happened before. What's unprecedented is that one day the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Hmm. Hmm. Um, what's unprecedented is one day a man rose up from the tomb. That's unprecedented. Huh. So as we're walking through this, it's difficult for us. And often we can think my world ought to be safe. My world ought to be predictable. My world ought to look the way that I expect it to work. But for most human beings in most times, including for most Christians, that hadn't been the case. Yep. So there's a way in which I think there's an opportunity to look for uh, not what new thing has fallen apart in the world, but what new thing is God doing in Jesus that I can bring to it. For me, um, the last several years have been uh, just a unique and surreal and awful painful time. Right. Um, my dad uh, was diagnosed with uh, cavernoma in his brainstem and over the process of a year and a half passed away. Right. Uh, the church that I used to be at uh, back in Chicago, Willow Creek, went through a very, very traumatic situation and I was involved with that and it got quite public and quite ugly. Yep. Uh, our daughter, Laura, who you have met, went through three miscarriages and clinical levels of anxiety that were really, really difficult. Um, and then more recently, there's been a family situation. Some folks listening to this may know about, I don't need to go into detail around it, but it's, it's ended up resulting in uh, estrangement, um, uh, indescribable pain, my needing to leave our church uh, and so all that has led me to a season of feeling like uh, my world was just shattered and the bottom fell out of it. Mm. And uh, uh, it has been uniquely painful. I mean, just trauma is probably the best word I have to describe it. Yeah. Um, I, when, I was, when I was writing about this season, uh, I was writing down, what, what do I grieve? And, you know, that was a long list and what's the meaning of it? But then uh, trauma was the word that when I hit that word, there were like 25 moments 
uh, of greater trauma than I had ever known. Wow. And um, so what happened then was from, you know, when it all hit, November 28th, 15 months ago, uh, I was just forced to, I, I, I have not been able to sleep well at night when I get up in the morning, uh, just start by saying, God, I need a thought. Hmm. Uh, my mind is, I've been reading a book called You Are Not Your Brain. It's a very helpful book by a Christian neuroscientist named Jeffrey Swartz, and he talks about our minds are filled with what he calls deceptive brain messages. That's a great phrase. Really, really good. It's a great phrase. If anybody uh, struggles with their mind and they're looking for uh, a helpful resource, that book for me was very helpful. And uh, the signature of the deceptive brain message isn't necessarily that it's false. Um, it's that it leads to a quality of brooding and ruminating that causes me to spiral into paralysis and resentment or fear. And instead of engaging me uh, to deal with life, uh, it, it, it robs me of life. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I need to be able to recognize that, to identify it, and then to refocus my mind. And so that process of every morning, I mean, I did it this morning, uh, just sitting with God and um, meditating and praying, reading a little bit of scripture, and then saying, what's the thought that I can root my mind in today that will enable me to deal with a world where horrible things have happened and worse things may happen? And uh, I don't know how I would have lived the last 15 months without that. Mm -hmm. For the word trauma, yeah. The minute you said that, I went, yeah, I've felt that way. Yeah. I mean, it, it, I, this year has been sleepless nights, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But for, for almost anybody leading, this has been that year. Yes, right. Unless right. they're on the lunatic fringe, they're winning. Okay? <laughs> But, the, but for normal people with it's, wisdom that are, in the, that are centrist, this uh -huh. has been the year from hell. Yeah. You just laid out more honesty than I've any, heard any Christian leader talk about this. Are there two or three things that have been most helpful to you that you think would be helpful to other people mm -hmm. processing the same kinds of trauma? Yeah. Um, I, uh, because of my wife's work, um, where we're living right now, we had to move out of and sell the condo that we were living in the, in the Bay Area, so we're staying in another place. And <coughs> she will bring in groups of pastors in the Bay Area about every week. And um, uh, we'll ask everybody to talk about what's a challenge you're facing, and it's been fascinating yeah. every time we do that. And as people go around the circle, yeah. um, COVID, uh, the loss of predictability, not having people in the room, I can't read their body language, I can't preach their, read their faces, I gotta look into a camera. Um, uh, politics and the polarization of the churches and the fact that many yeah. people in churches now receive their identity more from their political affiliation than they do from Jesus Christ. Oh, that's good. And pastors are getting killed by that. And um, so it's very clear it'll take different forms with different people, but trauma is a big word from this last year. Yep. Um, Yes, I, I, I would say, I'll give a personal thought and then a practice. The, the thought is uh, that when I cannot control the outcome, I can pursue meaning. Hmm. And one of the things wow. that has uh, enabled me to go every day is, you know, I've lost this, I've lost that. Uh, I may lose, there may be other horrible things that happen, but uh, uh, I can show courage, I can show resilience, I can prepare to die, I can learn to let go, I can love my wife, uh, I can grow in faith. And that's the essence of the kingdom. I mean, the other stuff, Dallas Willard, who we may talk about, who was really influential for me and many, many folks used to say, the main thing God gets out of your life is the person you become. Oh, man. And that's the main thing you get out of your life. The main thing that God gets out of your life is not Bayside and it's not Thrive um, because persons are the only entities that will go into eternity. Nothing else will, but yeah. persons will. Mm -hmm. And so 
I get to work on that. So that passage in 2 Corinthians 4, gosh, Ray, I remember writing down each of these phrases and then just writing about them. Uh, Therefore, we do not lose heart. Although outwardly we're wasting away, inwardly we're being renewed day by day. For I'm convinced that these light and momentary afflictions, this is Paul sitting in prison, beaten, scourged, starved, these light momentary afflictions are not worth comparing to the eternal weight of glory that they are achieving for us. Therefore, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen, for what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. And so I'd write down, wasting away, um, my job, finances, relationships, family, reputation. Our golf swings. <laughs> that was never there. So it, you cannot waste what you never had. Uh, uh, but then I can be inwardly renewed today. I can experience the love of God today. I can be experience myself as somebody that God cares about. I can be with you. There can be joy. I can have faith. I can have courage. And ju- that meaning is available to me today. Uh-huh. When I cannot control my circumstances, meaning available. So, so that has been huge. The pursuit of meaning with God and being inwardly renewed when I feel like outwardly I'm wasting away. And then the other part is I have never leaned into community so much. And I think precisely because COVID has often had an isolating impact yeah. and that political polarization has a dividing impact. So the need for people just... Um, to love, to connect, to laugh, to talk, to help, to receive help. Uh, uh, I have never needed that more. And it's a little bit like, you know, when you're in a war, one of the byproducts is the relationships that get formed. And you'll think I'm making this up. I'm not. My mom had three brothers and their names were Hack, Jack and Mac. (laughs) <laughs> Those are my uncles. Um, people used to laugh when I was telling them that. I didn't know that Where that were was they funny. raised? Uh, Rockford, Illinois. Okay. Uh, they were born in St. Francisville, tiny little town, extreme southern Illinois. Okay. Um, but they were all three in World War II. And oh. their stories of World War yeah. II and the family stories when Mac, the youngest at 18, was the last one to leave home and head off to war and uh, not know when they would come back. But or the if relationships, they'd come back, or if they would yep. come back. But the relationships that get formed in times of intensity or trauma, there is often an acceleration of depth because there's a vulnerability and an openness and a level of sharing. And I think that is one of the things in a crisis. Uh, I know talks that I have with other pastors um, have a kind of depth to them and an aliveness to them. Yeah. Yeah. Partly because of this year, yeah. partly because of what I'm going through, yeah. where we can connect with each other. Yeah. Uh, in a much deeper way. Uh-huh. You know, you connect in suffering in a way that you don't connect in triumph. Yeah, yeah. So so relationship and connection for me has been the other thing that I would say uh, has, has helped me endure this year. The crisis that has invaded everybody's lives this mm-hmm. year, um, it's just made life a lot more challenging. Like, yeah. I don't know anybody who's challenged. And challenge and support when my challenges go up and my support doesn't. Yeah. That's destructive stress. <clears throat> and that leads to relational breakdown, psychological breakdown, substance abuse, alcohol abuse, yeah. inappropriate sexual relationships, a lot of which is inappropriate stress relief. Yes. Um, wh- I don't think you'd be able to be standing, none of us would, if we didn't figure out how to get a little more support this year. Mm -hmm. What have you done to get that? You know, uh, one of the things that I did was to ask a group of people to just serve as a support team for us. Super. And so I was uh, having conversations with Gordon McDonald, who you probably know, pastor, and he went through something traumatic, different set of circumstances, but traumatic where he had to step out of ministry. And he talked about how he and his wife, Gail, recruited, uh, uh, they call them a group of angels. And so I asked a group of uh, uh, seven people if they would be willing to come alongside of Nancy and me and be our Zoom support team. And so... Uh, we created that and, and told them we'd like to talk about how are we doing emotionally, how are we doing spiritually, how are we doing physically and sexually, how are we doing financially, how are we relating with each other, what are we looking at for the future. Uh, and, and they all said they would love to do that. And Gordon has been another person where 
uh, I asked, would it be okay if we had a regular conversation with each other? Right. And he said, yeah, he would love to do that. Yep. And he's a very wise person. Yep. So I think that the very fact that we're in a situation of uh, unusual trauma um, often opens people up to saying, I'd like to help. I'd like to yep. be a part of supporting you. Yep. And um, so those are kind of formal situations. And then I've just been very intentional about in walking through this difficult season. It's a painful story for me to tell. Yes. But I had a uh, understanding early on that I needed to tell it. I don't know why. I didn't know why fully. And it took about 45 minutes to walk people through everything. Mm -hmm. And as you might imagine, it was painful every time. Yes. And it took a long time to realize um, when you're in a difficult season, healing comes when you tell the story in a way that it doesn't come if you avoid the story. Yeah. Yeah. And it was a little like, I had my tonsils out when I was 30, which is a bad time <laughs> to have your tonsils out. <laughs> it hurt. Um, but the doctor says, kind of counterintuitive, it really hurts to, to swallow. You wake up after you had your tonsils out in the middle of the night, your throat's dry, yep. it's like a knife. Yep. But um, the more you swallow, the quicker you heal. Oh, wow. And I, I found that telling the story was like that. The, the more that I told people the story, they felt connected with me. Yes. Yeah. So even though I felt very vulnerable yep. and it took energy to do it, then instead of them being out there wondering what's going on, uh, is there something bad, uh, they knew everything and they could be with me and for me. Yep. And so disclosing to the appropriate people, here's the events that have been going on and here's how I'm feeling, here's what it's doing to my heart. Yep. Um, actually created, I don't know, Ray, it's like uh, uh, <laughs> um, blood vessels opening up that are bringing blood into the place that needs to be nourished and healed yep. rather than closing it off. Mm -hmm. So it's actually okay for a pastor to seek support. Oh, man. Because, uh, I mean, we're, we're the ones dispensing support. Yeah, yeah. And generally not wanting to look inadequate or unspiritual to actually ask for it. Nancy and I have talked about this because both of us have been in pastor type roles for so long. Yes. And often we get much more comfortable. Uh -huh. You know, Ray, how are you doing? How can I help you? What's uh -huh. going on? How, uh -huh. you know, and, and to say, I really hurt. Uh -huh. And um, uh, I'd like to talk. And I would say, um, <coughs> you know, vulnerability is a funny thing. You never get comfortable being vulnerable. Oh, that's great. And it's part of what helps you know if a relationship is getting stagnant or not. Uh -huh. um, when you go into what Scott Peck used to call the tunnel of chaos, uh -huh. there will always be a sense of risk. Mm -hmm. And that's the vulnerability piece. Mm -hmm. um, but that's what makes it a living connection yep. and enables love from the other person uh, uh, to pour into you. And of course, it has to be reciprocal. I can't just be a leech trying to sponge off of people all the time. So there's all of the dynamics of a healthy relationship that are part of it. But yeah, I think this year especially, oh, we had a meeting a couple weeks ago, I don't know, 20 pastors from one part of the Bay Area. And one of the pastors, maybe the one that is a very effective pastor, great leader of great church. And he just said, I don't like my job anymore. Oh. Every pastor in the America just raised their hand. And the whole room, it was like, it just got <laughs> still as a pin. Because A, nobody could believe that he would say it. Yeah. And B, everyone's like, that's exactly how I feel. But I've never let myself say those words. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. So then this conversation goes where it goes. Yeah. The, um, we're both in touch with a lot of pastors yes. somehow. Yeah. There's an epidemic of quitting. Yeah. Um, and the only people doing really well right now are Christian search firms because every <laughs> pastor is now looking for a placement. I would, yeah, I and half of them are going to work for Christian search firms. No, kid. I was on the phone with a mega church in the Midwest this week where their leaders are going, our pastor just walked out the door, bam. Yeah. And I mean, multiple thousands of people who are already having tough lives yeah. just went, our pastor just walked out on us. Yeah. What do we, you know, yeah. it's been crazy. Yeah. And matter of fact, the wind's kicking up here. Everybody's feeling like that around the, yeah. around the world. Yeah. Um, what would you say to a pastor that's going, I've had it. Yeah. I quit. Yeah. 
What would you say to that person that's at least going, you know what, I'm ready to throw in the towel? Well, I would say, you know, the wind is also an expression of the Holy Spirit that blows like the wind. And the Spirit is present in chaos, and the Spirit is present in difficulties. Yep. And um, I, I've thought, Ray, this might be a great talk for you to do, or we could work on it together. Somebody needs to do a talk in our day about why to become a pastor. Yep. Um, yep. I remember when I was going through Wheaton College, and I had a Greek New Testament prof, Jerry Hawthorne, and we would gather together sometimes, and we would say, I know a lot of you guys could become a doctor, a lawyer, whatever you want to, but some of you ought to consider devoting yourselves to the church. And I was so inspired and challenged by that. Huh. And, and I think a single starting place is um, with the notion of calling. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean necessarily a, a uh, mystical, uh, experience of calling. I never actually had that. I, I just, I, I chose to become a pastor. Mm -hmm. um, but that sense that uh, the offer that Jesus presents remains the greatest one known to humanity. Mm -hmm. If somebody knows of a better one, I'd like to hear it. Uh -huh. I, I really would. But it, it, it remains unparalleled. And the church remains the single unique steward of that offer. And whether we are in a bull market for churches or a bear market for That's churches, it doesn't it. matter. Yep. And in some ways, yep. the call becomes all that more urgent when the headwinds are stronger. Yep. And so, but then what that means is, uh, I think for most of us in churches, certainly for me, the temptation is to run on the fuel of how well does it look like the church is doing, uh -huh. yes. rather than the fuel of the love of God. Mm -hmm. and being cared for by God. Mm -hmm. And so years and years ago, uh, I was on the first sabbatical I ever took and I went to talk with Dallas Willard and I, w I wanted to ask him about churches and how they could be effective and how to grow disciples. So I asked him that, what, what do I need to do to really help people in my church grow as disciples? And there was a long pause, always with Dallas. And then he said, you must arrange your life so that you are experiencing deep contentment, joy, and confidence in your everyday life with God. Mm. And I said, no, no, I'm not asking about me. <laughs> I'm talking about them. <laughs> They're the ones that need to grow. And he said, no, the, the truth is you will reproduce yourself. Mm. Mm. And if there is a gap between uh, what you say and who you are, how you live, the people closest to you will believe how you live and that's what they will enter into and that will just yep. trickle out. So uh, if you want to lead people into the way of Jesus, you must arrange your life so that you are experiencing deep contentment, joy, and confidence yeah. in your every, you cannot expect the elders to do that or the deacons yeah. or whoever, you can't expect your staff to do that. You cannot expect your spouse to do that. You can't wait for COVID yeah. to be over. Yeah. You can't wait for political mm. turmoil to be wrecked. Mm. You must do that today. Mm. And um, I actually have a sign, our staff, I talked about that so much, our staff uh, created a big sign and where Nancy and I live now, we don't have much with us because we had to sell off all the stuff in our old condo. But I have that sign, and it's the last thing I look at when I go to bed at night, the first words that I see when I wake up in the morning. So for anybody who's listening to us, now there's all kinds of things strategically that will need to be done to try to help churches be effective. Yes. How do you learn to be effective um, in a season like COVID? Yeah. But it doesn't start there. It starts with what is inside of me, with my own, the quality of my own life with God. No, it's, you know, it's funny. You get wisdom from deep ways, Dallas Willard, stuff like that. I get it in shallow ways. So I'm assuming you saw the movie E.T. Oh, yeah. I mean, who didn't? Yeah. Which I thought was a complete ripoff of the Bible. Uh, I mean, this guy comes to earth, mm -hmm. lives a really nice life, heals somebody with a touch. Yeah. Dies, oh, that's good. resurrects, and ascends. I'm going, where have I heard that before? <laughs> so I'm going, rip, and made a billion dollars ripping off the gospel. Yeah. Um, but the scene in that movie that struck me was, the kid and E.T. are connected, and the kid is getting sicker and sicker. Oh, E.T. is oh, yeah. getting sicker and yeah, sicker. Yeah, yeah. And he disconnect. They had to disconnect, and then that led to healing. Yeah. And, and when I saw that, I went, if 
I don't disconnect my, how I feel about myself, right. how right. I feel about right. life, how I feel about God, how I feel about joy. If I don't disconnect that from ministry success, then my, I will be an emotional slave to ministry success my yeah. entire life. Yeah. And, no, um, outcomes are a great source of feedback, but a terrible source of fuel. Yeah, well, that's a great way to put it. And uh, uh, most of us battle with that. Yeah. You know, we're all tempted to run on the fuel of good outcomes. Yep. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that boy, that is good. So then there are some things that kill it. Um, and I mean, well, let me put it this way. You ever been criticized? We have both. Gotten, Not yet, but I'm, but I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm expecting sure, it I'm any sure day. It's going, well, I'll be posting something this afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> the, we, uh, the, every leader I know has just gotten shredded me. I, I don't yeah. even read social media anymore. Matter of yeah. fact, this year I felt like anybody on social media is getting dumber and madder. And so I pretty much went mm -hmm. ditching. The, but I talked with a guy one time who trains church planters. Mm -hmm. And he said, here's what I tell church planters. The success of your life and the number one key to your ministry is letting go of bitterness fast. Mm. I had never heard anybody, he like he was like all the strategy, all the preaching, all the leading, he goes, no, if, he goes, the key yeah. is letting go of bitterness fast. Yeah. Have you felt that stuff and what have you done with bitterness? Oh, I, I, uh, that one is very, very fresh for me. This last week has been a very difficult week. Mm. And there have been uh, a number of those moments that were quite traumatic um, where I will find my mind uh, uh, to cite another movie. Did you ever see a movie called The Straight Story? No. Get to watch it sometime if you ever get a chance. It's a story, a true story. Guy who is old, failing health, he gets on his riding lawnmower because he can't drive a car and drives across three states to see and be reconciled with his brother. Wow. It's a killer movie, The Straight Story. Uh, but at the beginning of the movie, because he's arthritic and quite crippled, uh, he gets a, a thing called a grabber, because he can't bend down, so you, you, like, you squeeze your hand and, and it grabs whatever. And my mind will feel like a grabber. It, it's like it will spasm around to resentment. You know, I'm thinking of uh, an email that somebody sent me and that feels unfair to me, uh, and it may be, and I may need to respond to it. But where I can tell I'm in trouble is my mind can't let it go. Yeah. And yeah. it spirals and spirals and spirals. Yeah. And so that's where, uh, yes, it's true that letting go of that is critically important. The help that I have needed is how do I do that? Because yeah. when it festers deeply enough, I cannot do it by an act of the will. Yeah. And so that's where just learning things like, how do I learn how to meditate so that I can be able to refocus my mind? Yep. Or if it gets bad enough, simply change an activity. Uh, yep. Go talk to a friend. Yep. Uh, go watch ET. Go do something to get your mind out of that yep. spiral. Yep. Because yes, that uh, yep. resentment is the number one killer. There is a reason why when Jesus was going through the Sermon on the Mount, and talking about what does it look like to have a righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, the first topic that he deals with is anger and resentment. Yeah. Boy, that is good. Yeah. So I want to talk about a live mind. Yes. Okay? One of my theories is nobody lives well, loves well, or leads well until they think well. Most people just don't spend a lot of time thinking. Hmm. Uh, matter of fact, I had a senior level business consultant, uh, well, he's a CEO, and he brought in a consultant and, this, and they spent three days together and the consultant met with them and he charged them a ton of money and gave them two words, think more. Wow. Because the problem is this, you're so busy, you don't have time to think, which means you're, nobody's going directionally down the road. Yes. Okay? Um, what would you say, you have one of the most vibrant minds of anybody I know. For somebody that needs to do more of that, what advice would you give them? What do you, or what do you do? You know, uh, I think the danger is we just slide into autopilot and default mode. Yep. And life conspires to cause us to do this. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, it's mostly just simply because it's easy to do. Mm -hmm. uh, there's this whole area of research I've been thinking about a lot lately. We talked a little bit about it. It's what is called flow. And um, 
uh, psychologist researcher named Six Semi High. It's, he's got like his name is 80 letters long and they're almost all consonants. But he looks at, <laughs> he started with artists and athletes that have these peak moments in life, this optimal experience, and he calls it flow. And yeah, you're in the zone. Yes, you're in the zone. That's exactly right. Uh, Jordan, when he can't miss a shot. Yep. And um, uh, uh, he studies the nature of consciousness really carefully. What is that ceaseless flow of thoughts, intentions going on in your mind? The number one finding of his research is that the mind unaided tends towards chaos. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, it tends towards anxiety and towards anger. And so what that- no, Say that again, because that's important. Yeah. The mind unaided, unaided. tends towards chaos. Uh, uh, anxiety, fear, uncertainty about the future. Yep. and then anger. Yep. And uh, so the number one reason why we spend so much time in front of screens, television or phones, isn't because it's a vital life enhancing way to live. It's yep. because we're outsourcing our consciousness. Okay. In other words, uh, the great art of life is managing consciousness. Mm -hmm. That'll sound a little odd, but, but basically the great task of life is to manage consciousness. Yep. When Jesus talks about don't try to clean up the outside of the cup, focus on the inside. When he's talking about the inside of the cup or the inside of the tomb or a good tree, he's just talking about what are the patterns of thoughts and feelings, the consciousness that's going on inside you. Yep. And we actually live in a day where it is so easy to outsource consciousness by looking at a screen that our ability to manage consciousness is probably weaker than it's ever been in human history. Huh. Huh. And so for anybody who wants to be fully alive, discover how do you learn best? I love to read. Um, some people learn best by experience. Some people learn best by conversation, talking with other people. Some folks love to have a class. Some people are very, uh, they, they're artists, they wanna do. It'll be different, but find out what it is and then devote yourself to it and be intentional about it and um, get hooked on the growth that it produces. Yep. You know, when Paul says, redeem yeah. the time for the days are evil, yep. they, it's not mostly just, you know, corrupt sexual practices or something. It's yep. the devil will tempt you to waste your life with nothing. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to. The devil will tempt you to waste your life with nothing. Yes. It's yeah. the average American life. It is. It is. Just, just um, how do I get more money? Uh, how could I be more successful? Uh, anger fantasies about this hurt person hurt me in this way. Yep. Um, pornography or sexual addiction, just sitting in front of a television set or instead of in front of a video game or uh, uh, shopping as escapism. It's uh, the power of nothing is very, very strong. Mm. And an active mind. Um, uh, Wait, that would be a great book. The Power of Nothing. Yes. The Average American Life. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, and it really man. is true. It really is true. That is good. Yeah. Um, the 20 years ago or so, at a Willow Creek Leadership Conference, mm -hmm. you used a phrase I'd never heard anybody say before mm -hmm. or since, but I've been thinking about it for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And you did a talk on shadow mission. Do you remember that talk? I do. Okay, yeah. what is it? Yeah. Well, and if you don't mind, what is it and what did you say yours was? Yeah. So uh, it actually got born when I went to a really weird uh, men's retreat. <laughs> it was not faith-based and they had very strange practices, which I would not recommend. I don't think all of them hit the therapeutic bar. Uh, but at one <laughs> point, guys were talking about uh, that idea of um, your shadow self or your shadow life. In other words, um, uh, if you didn't arrest negative destructive tendencies in you, what could you become? Yep. How would you throw away your life? And so he said uh, his shadow mission, I'll just use the language that he used here, uh, was to uh, sit around watching TV and jerking off while the world goes to hell. And all the guys around the circle, about 30 of us there, kind of chuckled a little nervously. And then the guy who was facilitating the group said, I'm gonna ask him to say this one more time, only this time nobody laugh. Hmm. And so it was quiet for a moment, and then he said, my shadow mission is to watch TV and jerk off while the world goes to hell. And we all sat there with it because it might not be that one, but for all of us, like, 
here's this amazing gift of life and a world in such need. And I could be trying to help, you know, with hunger and change the life of a child or to bring the gospel to people and that I could just spend my life doing that. So um, that just caused me to think a lot about that idea of a shadow mission, that all of us were made to have a mission, to have a purpose. That's part of having the image of God in you. Yep. Um, but the devil wants to tempt you away from that. Mm -hmm. And it will probably happen not by leading you in 180 degrees the opposite direction. He will take whatever your gifts are and bend them just five or 10 degrees so that you use them for yourself. Mm -hmm. And then that will become your shadow mission. And uh, when I was growing up, I loved speaking. I learned early on, I think I was two years old when I did my first talk in church. <laughs> <laughs> my sister, who was three, was supposed to do it. And I learned her talk and it's got good. up and did it myself. And so I think I was 11 or 12. And I would speak at churches or other places sometimes. And uh, Rockford's not a big town. All three of my uncles, Hack, Jack, and Mac, worked at the Rockford <laughs> newspaper. So there was an article about me and that said, talkative boy wins acclaim. Mm. And uh, uh, so I knew what my shadow mission was way before I ever had a sense of what my mission was. Talkative boy wins acclaim. Try to use whatever gifts I have to make people say, wow, look at him, isn't that something? That is my shadow mission and I will always wrestle with that. And I think each of us has a shadow mission. I think Jesus had a shadow mission. Uh, I think churches have shadow missions. And to identify what our shadow mission is, to let other people speak into it. If you're the leader um, and you have a team that works with you, you may not know what your shadow mission is. I will guarantee you your team knows what your shadow mission is. Oh, that's good. That's good. Yeah, what's funny, when you talked about that, I think every pastor in there is going, I am speaking and I really should be hoping these people fall in love with Jesus more, follow him more fully yeah. and get this into their lives. Yeah. But instead I'm thinking, I hope they all walk out of here and go, that guy's an unbelievable communicator. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. They, yep. um, yeah, it's funny. Mine, after that, I had some yeah. deep work kind of going, what's yeah. mine? Yeah. When I was a kid, my, my dad played college football at the University of Minnesota, real good athlete, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. I played basketball in college, blah, blah, blah. I was in every sport imaginable. And I think I was about sixth grade, I was on a swim team and was in a swim meet. And I won three of the events and I lost the fourth one. We're driving home. The only conversation we had was why did I lose the fourth one oh, wow. with my dad? And I remember him going, uh, he was not happy. And I think he'd had a couple drinks and he was not happy. And he said something like, I don't think he tried. And, wow. and I was wrecked. Yeah. And I learned, somehow I learned, if you don't win, you're not okay. Mm -hmm. Or it's not okay, or something's not okay. So my shot. So I, when you when you said that, yeah. I went. My shadow win mission is win. Yeah. And the problem is removing that. I don't think is possible. So I feel like God's gone. Okay. So you know, so you have to crucify it. Yeah. Which means you have to flip it and go. How do you create a win for other people? Hmm. Hmm. And, well, and that's so, really good. You know, in yeah. a sense, so so yeah. to go, all right, I, instead of being the platform, how do I create a platform? Right. Instead of, you know, it's sort of this lifelong process, but. No, I think that's it, really good because there is just a real basic notion there that uh, that which we crucify um, doesn't cease to exist. It becomes resurrected as God intended it to be. That's good. And so a crucified shadow mission actually becomes your God-given mission. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, which, that's a great way to put it because it was, but that talk was very helpful in redirecting yeah. that whole thing um, because I, you know, got to grow up in a family where how do I help my kids win? Yeah. As opposed to dad's going to win every argument we have or dad's going to win every conversation, all that yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah. It's a whole different ballgame. Matter of fact, my daughter Leslie's there um, who is still part of my life where she might not be, you know, if I hadn't gotten that straightened out. Um, I have a couple other questions and then we'll do a part two. Cool. In a golf cart with cameras on. I really like that idea. And people mm -hmm. will feel much better about their own golf games <laughs> after watching us. Um, the, what is, I don't know how many pastors we both know, mm -hmm. thousands and thousands. What is the number one behavior trait you have seen derail pastors and their careers? Yeah. 
I thought you were going to ask me your more provocative question that you posed earlier. What preachers currently preaching are going to go to hell? Yeah. <laughs> Apparently we're said, saving that we one. We don't have enough we're time. We're saving that one for part two. <laughs> um, I think... Uh, I think it would be isolation. Um, uh, another line from Dallas, which is very related to that. Uh, somebody, Gordon Cosby, Church of the Savior, one time asked him, uh, why is it that so often pastors, ministry leaders get derailed? Um, and uh, he talked about how uh, in the life of someone, of the great ones, uh, of, of Jesus' way, um, Francis of Assisi, uh, there will come a vision. Only the vision is not a vision of what I'm going to do. It's not a vision of the church that I'll build or the ministry I'll create. It's a vision of God and how good God is and what a wonderful thing it is to be alive in His universe. Because hmm. it's His project and this is all part of that. And out of the goodness and gratitude and joy of that will come the desire to want to do something good for Him. And then what happens is, with a Francis or a Wesley or a whoever, um, something begins to grow that's visible. And then people begin to look at that and think, oh, I want to be a part of that because I'll feel important if I am a part of that. And then uh, their attention shifts from the vision to the mission of what we're doing. And the preoccupation becomes metrics and goals, which are good things but can never be the main thing. Uh, and then you can't run on that, and you get exhausted and burnt out. And uh, the way that Dallas put that was um, uh, a lack of a deeply satisfying life always has the effect of making sin look good. Mm. Mm. And so um, when in ministry I begin to sacrifice uh, my own joy, um, to serve God, which means I'm working way too many hours, I'm resenting what people are doing, I'm clutching onto stuff to try to make my church grow a lot, and I get miserable, then I justify sin by saying, well, I'm working for God, I must take care of myself. And uh, uh, as soon as we get to that place where uh, our lives are miserable because of the way that we're doing ministry, um, I don't think anybody ever ends up in a ditch where they did not first live a miserable life. Hmm. And we will often look at them from the outside and say, oh, what a sad thing yep. that they ended up in a ditch. Yep. And Dallas says, no, the sad thing is the life they were living before they ended up in the ditch that made the ditch look good. That's the yep. sad thing. Well, that's, ex yeah, that's exactly right. And so, and so the single best practical step in that regard is for people in ministry um, have a fully disclosing friend. Mm -hmm. mm. Uh, have somebody in your life, uh, our friend Jimmy Mayotta that used to head up the Willow yes. Creek Association yeah. said uh, that based on their research, um, the number one practice that separates people from sustain a life in ministry uh, from people who don't is the practice of having a fully disclosing friend before whom I have no secrets. And uh, it can take a long time to nurture a relationship yeah. where you can yeah. trust somebody yeah. in that way. Boy, if you're a pastor, you got to find somebody that you know. It stops with them. It has to you, be. You, their trust level would have to be Scott. Yeah. Trust level no, and, be and sometimes people can talk about it like, just go find somebody and tell them everything. No. And don't. I can tell you, yep. if you tell the wrong person the wrong thing, yeah. it can ruin your life. That's right. That's so right. we need to be real sober about that. Exactly right. Um, but over a period of years, um, you just run tests. You get to yep. know that person. You share, I share something with you that you could hurt me with a little bit. Yes. Not destroy me, but hurt me. Yep. And then I find out, um, do you try to jump in and fix it? Do you gossip about it? Do you honor confidentiality? Yep. Do you listen well? Do you have good judgment? Do you challenge? And we go step by step by step by step through that until we get to that place. And uh, my friend Rick, I talk with every morning in, uh, yep. at 6.50. And uh, I have no secrets, sexually, financially, anything. Yep. But it was many, many years to get there. Yep, yep. Um, what? Uh, three questions, and then we'll do part two in a golf cart. Okay. They. Um, what mattered to you twenty years ago, 
that doesn't matter as much now? And what matters more to you now than it did 20 years ago? Um, you know, I'm a three on the Enneagram. Some folks listen will know about that. So I'll always wrestle with reputation. Uh, but for sure, it matters to me less now than it did 20 years ago. And partly it's been over this last year or two. Um, so much stuff has just gotten said or written in the little world in which I live that was painful. Um, but there was a wonderful piece in that. I was talking to my sister about that, about how like uh, so painful to see this written and so painful oh. to see that. And, and then the next day the sun came up. And then the next day the sun came up. <laughs> and my wife still loves me. And my daughter Laura, who's sitting over there, for the most part, still loves me. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I still get to know God and I still get to talk to Ray Johnston. Yep. And I said, it's like this reputation that I thought was such an important thing uh, turned out to be just a burden. I wasn't setting down a treasure. I was setting down a burden. Doesn't uh, matter. Uh, All that a reputation is, is what other people think of you. And often there's this notion that the, uh, a good reputation is a great prize or a great possession. No, it's not. A good character is. A reputation is just what other people think. Yep. And it doesn't matter. And to be liberated from it is really, really good. Now, I still wrestle with that. I will fight with that as long as yep. I live. Yep. But I've tasted it a lot more than I had 20 Everybody years ago. Everybody leading anything knows exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Would you say that some things are liberating to hear? Yeah. Yes. A good reputation is... It is a burden. It is not a treasure. Brilliant. Just brilliant. Just let it down. Just let it go. Oh, that, and what matters more? Um, gratitude. Mm. Gratitude. One of the things I've been doing, uh, particularly this last year and a half, is every morning, uh, among other things, I'll review the previous day uh, and just simply name three uh, events or gifts that uh, I was grateful for. And... I'll write them down because that helps me. And that cultivates uh, just a habit, a uh, reflexive habit of looking for them through the day. Yeah. So I did that this morning, uh, playing golf with you and Dave and Chris uh, in a beautiful setting was- That was so uh, fun. One of those items was like, I can't believe I got to do that. What a wonderful thing. And to see all that beauty. And um, so recognizing gratitude is always available. It's like this remarkable gift that's always there. And so often I just don't think to avail myself of it. Yeah. 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 Gratitude. Yeah. That, by the way, just an insider look at our golf game. We had a ball. We all play mediocre golf. He hits the ball a mile, people, when he connects. So we're, getting, we're doing steroid <laughs> check after the statement. Um, and it was so fun because my buddy Chris Hushaw, who is the best pastoring pastor that I know in the world. Yeah. Okay. He came up to me. We we, we won. I think we cheated, and <laughs> and which means the the prize he had to get us was a signed golf yeah. ball. Yeah. Okay. And um and so Chris goes. He goes, yeah, I'm going to have John Ortberg's autograph on a golf ball. I'm going to put it right by his collection of books I got. So that was good. Which which leads me to another question. You're well known, but among people that know you well, you're well loved. Mm. And I, <clears throat> dang it, um, you're just one of the best people I know. You have had a ministry to me and to pastors. You've been able to, to speak God's word in a way that people that normally wouldn't get a hear, would listen, would listen. Mm. They, um, everybody I know that knows you well, like Dave Bixby here, they're like, I'll take any time with I can get because he's just such a joy to be around. He's about you, he's not about himself, he's fun, all this kind of stuff. And the problem is, once internet flares up, we just get, um, just, there's some really, really great people and good people in America that are taking a beating. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so the, I went to your daughter, Lori, here, who is spectacular. She just, she, I, the, I don't know your other kids, but dinner last night, mm -hmm. walked out of there, my daughter Leslie and I, we talked about her, we're like, she's just amazing, mm -hmm. okay? 
And is she around? No, she's over there uh, working. Um, and so I said, I said, your dad's one of the best people I know. And I said, what one question should I ask him? Mm -hmm. And she said, ask him this, okay? What one thing have you learned from your wife? Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> Laura, we stumped him. Uh, actually, Ray, uh, what I was thinking was, um, Arthur Ashe, the tennis player, uh, he used to have 22 different ways to hit a backhand. And he actually had to eliminate a whole bunch of them because it was too difficult for him in the moment to decide which of 22 backhands to hit. So I was thinking of too many options at that moment. Uh, uh, the single one that I'll mention is that uh, Nancy taught me uh, the, the growth and even deeper intimacy that can come out of a passionate commitment to honesty, including conflict as it's needed. Hmm. And I grew up in a... Uh, Swedish town where uh, <laughs> pouting was the primary spiritual gift and passive aggressive dynamics were often uh, what ruled. And so just honest uh, uh -huh. disagreement and challenge while remaining connected and being able to let go of it were just not something that I tended to see a lot and I did not bring naturally. And Nancy does. And um, she's also the most fun person I know and she's got a heart as big as all outdoors, and to learn that those things can go together and that uh, I can prize independence. I did not do that before Nancy, and I do now. So to learn to prize independence, partly because that actually enables me to connect more, mm -hmm. and to prize truth-telling mm -hmm. and conflict as a way to deeper connection rather than as connection destroyers, um, is the primary way out of at least 22 that um, she has changed my life. <laughs> That's good. Well, we'll be pulling that question out before my wife hears this. <laughs> the, um, <laughs> and um, by the way, the next conversation we're gonna have, I didn't get to a ton of stuff. I wanna have a conversation with you about the church and the future of the Christian church. Love to. What it should start doing, keep doing, and stop doing. I wanna have a conversation about faith and doubt. You wrote my favorite book on that subject. Mm -hmm. Okay. I want to have a conversation about preaching. Um, I want to have a conversation about leading. And I want to have a conversation about the fact that we've both been in large organizations. Institutions can damage inspiration. Mm -hmm. And yeah. how do you continue to be effective but inspiring at the same time? And a healthy, how do you create a healthy work environment? Um, I mean, I have a whole Wonderful. list of part two or three yeah. or whatever on this one. But my last question is, when I was with Brian Houston, he asked me a question, he said, what do you want on your tombstone? Uh -huh. What do you most want to be remembered for? Mm. And how would you answer that? Yeah, um, I was thinking about that, uh, not for me, but for somebody else. And the phrase that came to mind when I was thinking about this other person was uh, 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 in James talking about Abraham, and it says he was called a friend of God. Mm. So I thought, friend of God, mm. I, I like that. That's good. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I'm glad we're friends. So, that is good. Hey, thank you so much for this. Um, and, folks, we'll be back with part two. This is great. So, God bless everybody. Well, we're not going to keep you any longer. We, what a great interview, jam packed with some really good encouragement and things to learn from John and Ray. But next week, we're going to be having Andrew McCourt and we're also going to have Ray Johnston. They're going to be talking about what do we do when leaders fail. So God bless you all. Have a wonderful weekend of ministry and take care.